Uh, Mr. Godman, for people who know Bhagwan Sri Ramana Maharishi and, and his teachings, they definitely know self-inquiry. I was wondering, what about the role of devotion and surrender? How to surrender and what is true devotion and why it seems that surrender is so difficult? So Jesse said I had to answer the question, why, why is it so hard to surrender? And I would say, why is it so hard to do self-inquiry? Also, somebody once asked Bhagavan, why am I not right now in the state of self? What, what is preventing me from being in that state right now? And his one-line answer, which I really love, is your wandering mind and your perverted ways. So that, that for me is the bottom line as to why we all find it difficult. None of us, or very few of us, have the ability to stop the wandering mind and none of us seem to have the ability to curb all the perverse habits that are extroverting our attention and making us engage with the world. With regard to the how-to, um, I think people, people would come and Bhagavan might suggest self-inquiry and they would try it and they found it too abstract, um, too analytical, it wasn't catering to their inherent devotional instincts and they would feel more of an attraction to a devotional path. So they would ask Bhagavan for permission to do this and he would always grant it. He liked people to do self-inquiry but he realised that it wasn't a one-size-fits-all method and that some people were not temperamentally suited to that. So then he would say, OK, surrender unconditionally to the self. But having said that, he was the first to admit that this is, for the vast majority of people, an absolutely impossible thing to do. You cannot say, God, I surrender to you in one session, in one jump, in one process. Bhagavan accepted this. He said, your notion of I is so embedded, so inherently strong, you can't give it up by a desire, by an act of will, or by notionally offering yourself and everything you do to God. So what Bhagavan recommended to one or two people was to have faith that God is running your life and I won't say test him, but prove it to yourself by offering small amounts of all the things that bother you, the things that are going on in your life. He would say, you think that right now you are in charge of your life, that you have to make choices and decisions and that the outcomes of all your activities have to come from the choices that you make. He said, that's completely wrong. He said, God is running this world. You as an individual person are not even in that world. Your, your choices and your decisions the actions that you perform all arise from your totally erroneous notion that you are a person who lives inside a body and once you have come to that conclusion, arrived at that idea of yourself, then automatically you have to defend that notion by defending the body, having ideas about how to protect the body, what plans the body is going to undergo and execute. He said that, that that's all wrong, but you can't give that up as an idea. It's such a deeply rooted, severely entrenched program that you have to convince yourself bit by bit that this is not a valid way of living in the world and it's based on a false premise. So he said, just try, think of something that's going on in your life that's bothering you. Approach your notion of God, it might be me, it might be some idea of the divine, it might be a form, and just say, right now this problem is bothering me, I hereby hand it over to you, you deal with it. And he, he said, then you can't cheat on this, you can't then go back to your normal life, lifestyle and carry on worrying about it. He said, that's like throwing out all your garbage and saying I've got rid of it, and then when no one is looking you collect it all up, bring it in your house and throw it all over your living room floor. He said, you've got to have that determination, which is quite counterintuitive, that it's not your business anymore, it's not your responsibility. Um, let's say, I don't know, your grandmother is sick, 
and you're worried about your grandmother being sick, you go to Bhagavan, you go to God, and you say, Bhagavan, this idea in my head is bothering me. I have a, a worry, a concern that this is going on. Uh, please take care of it. Please take this thought out of my head. And if you want to cure granny, that's a bonus. But I, I don't want to have this thought bothering me anymore. Then you go back to living your life. And it's not going to work if five minutes later you start worrying about granny again. You have to make this determined effort once you've handed over this little parcel of your worries and your concerns to say, I've put that out in the garbage can in the yard. It's not coming back in my house again. And he said, if you can do this with small details of your life, quite amazingly, you'll find that they resolve themselves better than if you yourself had decided, I'm in charge of this situation. I'm going to hire the best doctors. I'm going to get her treatment. I'm going to visit her every day. Just the simple act of handing over this story to the higher power and dropping it from all the things that go on in your mind that would normally worry about these things he said, just handing over one simple story and waiting and saying, I have given it to you. More often than not, something quite unexpected will happen. You'll get a good result out of it. And then you'll think to yourself, well, that worked. I'm going to try a slightly bigger story. So, so bit by bit, you start unloading all your problems, all your concerns, all your ideas. Then it's not always going to work. But after you've done that for some time, and you start to do your mental accounts, then you come to the conclusion that handing over these problems to Bhagavan has a higher percentage success rate than me trying to solve them myself. So he said, you establish the faith, the conviction that God can look after all these problems, all these concerns better than I can. You find that out empirically by forcing yourself to hand them over to this higher power, standing back, and waiting for events to unfold. And the more often you succeed, or the more often you get good results from doing this, the more often you feel inclined to say, well, that solves that problem. What's the next biggie kind of, what's the next biggie in my life? I will try and hand that one over as well. So it's a kind of salami approach. You can't throw the whole sausage at God and say, take it, I'm finished. You, you take the first slice off and you say, here, have a taste and it works and so you chop off two centimeters the next time and you throw it and bit, bit by bit you manage to hand over virtually all of your concerns about the way you run your life because you get proof that the surrender is working simply by the feedback that comes from having these problems resolve themselves. I have found this out from my own experience and Bhagavan said this, this is a very good way of convincing yourself that handing things over piece by piece is a good and valid way of eliminating this idea that there's a person inside your body who is responsible for, responsible for all these things and who has to take decisions to get the right outcome. The, the analogy I like is um, the younger people need this explained to them. 50 years ago, telephone exchanges had women inside them who took plugs out of one socket and made connections in the next socket and that's how you got your phones connected. These all got superseded by automatic exchanges where if you dialed the right number, there was no middleman, there was no intermediary. The call went through the right circuit in the exchange and the right person got the call. What we are doing is pretending that we are in charge of a kind of telephone exchange inside our head, which needs our intervention to make things happen well. In fact, what we're doing is pulling out random plugs in there, sticking them in the wrong holes and getting bad results. We need, we need to know and understand that Ishwara God is looking after the world and that anything that we do is simply going to get in his way. We, we are the person who ignorantly is running around the inside of this fictional telephone exchange, messing up with the wiring of Ishwara's world and trying to do a better job of running it. And the more we can, hand up, we, the more we can step back and come to the conviction, the conclusion that all this is humming along quite nicely and it doesn't need my intervention, the more smoothly your life will go. And finally, you'll just learn to understand the whole thing works by itself. It doesn't need my intervention. God is running this to the best possible outcome. I will stay out. At that point, 
when you've stopped taking decisions, when you've stopped thinking, I am the doer, when you stop thinking, I must do this, I must accomplish this, God is in charge of anything, then your I retreats back into the self and disappears. I, I just want to add one thing to that because it clarifies um, aspects of your original question and makes a good distinction between some of the terms involved. When Bhagavan said there were only two valid ways to realize the self, self-inquiry and self-surrender, he didn't include the word devotion. He, he didn't conflate devotion and surrender as being the same thing. In uh, verse 8 of Oladunapadu, he says that devotion to a name and form can enable you to see your deity in that particular name and form. He doesn't say that it leads to realization. He says that name and form worship, name and form obsession can make you become one with God. You can be absorbed in your chosen deity. You can have visions of that deity. But that's a state of union in which the I is lovingly experiencing unity with the divine. It's a very good precursor to the state of complete surrender, but it's not actually the surrender that Bhagavan is talking about. What Bhagavan is saying is that even the I that wants to be devoted to God, that wants to see God, ultimately has to realize that any external projection or form of God is ultimately unreal and it has to withdraw from that unitive experience and go back to the self and die. I'll mention here that uh, Papaji spent 25 years chanting Krishna's name and getting visions of Krishna. Krishna would come to see him, he would play with Krishna. This was all because his mother was an ardent Krishna Bhakta who interpreted an early direct experience of the self which Papaji had with a Krishna experience and Papaji wanted this direct experience back so his mother somehow persuaded them that if he became a Krishna devotee uh, the experience would come back. So Papaji was inclined towards visions, he was a very advanced soul. He said, I spent 25 years running after Krishna, having visions of him, I would play with him, Krishna would come and see me quite often. But he said, you get sidetracked by the bliss, by the ecstasy of having God appear in front of you. And he said, when I retired from my business activities in the 1960s, I had a chance to sit down and read uh, the books of many famous Indian saints of centuries gone by. And he said, I, I noted in almost all of their writings that a point would come where after a long period of communing with the divine, of playing with God, of being blissed out or ecstatically experiencing God, they realized that they had to give it up and go on to the formless. And he, he said he was reading Tukaram, he was reading uh, Mirabai, and he said you can always find the verse when somewhat begrudgingly they come to the conclusion that playing with God was great, that being absorbed in his bliss and his presence was great, but somehow it wasn't the end. To some extent it was actually a distraction, it was a diversion. He says you can get drunk on the bliss, you can get lost in the bliss, but your eye is always going to be there saying more, 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 I want more bliss, I want more ecstasy. Your craving for the ecstasy of divine union, he said, that, that in many cases is your last obstacle. You have to reach a point where your love for God is no longer extroverted into a desire to see a form, it has to go back to the God within yourself. He said, in my case, it took me 25 years and it was only sitting with Bhagavan who told me that any God who appears in front of me is not real, that God is within me as my own self. He said, I didn't like that message when Bhagavan first told it to me. In fact, I liked it so little, I went back to Chennai and didn't come again for a while. But he said, that, that was good advice. That ultimately was what put me back in the self. He said, I had this experience of the self when I was a very young boy. Then I spent 25 years running after an external form of God, being intensely devoted to it. But finally, finally, in the presence of Bhagavan, through his power, through his grace, Bhagavan showed me the truth of my own self. 
and he said that truth, implicit in that truth, is the knowledge and the understanding that there is nothing outside of that self that needs to be looked for or sought or experienced. He said that's what Bhagavan did for me. He pushed me back into the self and established me there with such force and conviction I no longer had the desire to look for anything outside of that self again. So he said this is a kind of trap that he, he fell into for decades. He said reading the famous Bhakti saints of India, he said they all to some extent experienced that same uh, devotional traje trajectory. They had decades of yearning to see God, be with God, and finally they just realized, no, that's not the end point. I need to go back to the, the silence and the stillness of the self and stay there. One of the aspects of the first question I was asked was, what are the problems uh, that's come up on the spiritual path and then we got on to talking about love, devotion and surrender and I think I can answer or at least give a rather graphic presentation of how difficult it might be by retelling the story of Matru Sri Sarada who was the devotee of Lakshmana Swami. Lakshmana Swami realized the self with Bhagavan in 1949 and then went back to his hometown and about 25 years later a young girl came to see him and she fell in love with him, did a very arduous uh, period of sadhana with him and finally realized herself almost exclusively through the practice of name and form meditation on her guru. So I think she's a really good case study on how everything needs to be lined up. It's almost like a, an absolutely uh, amazing astrological configuration. So many things have to be right in order to succeed on this particular path. And it was her destiny, her good fortune, that they were lined up, but she also put in an absolutely enormous amount of work. So I want to tell her story simply to illustrate that Name and form devotion is not an easy option. Uh, people who think that they can't do self-inquiry, either they try, they don't understand it, or it's too hard, or they're not making any progress, they think, well, I'll do name and form meditation, I'll worship my God, I'll do my japa, I'll say my mantras, because that's something concrete they can grasp. And because it is easier to grasp conceptually, I think some people have the idea that it might be easier to succeed simply because the initial grasp of the subject uh, is better. Uh, I'm going to be a party pooper here and probably spoil a lot of people's illusions about just how hard it is to get to self-realization, not just through self-inquiry, but also through the path of love, devotion and surrender. Saudama. Uh, came to Lakshmana Swami in Andhra Pradesh in 1975. She was a girl, uh, daughter of one of the old school friends of Lakshmana Swami. Lakshmana Swami didn't notice her on the first visit, but then he spotted her and he knew that she was going to come and see him. He had uh, had some sort of vision or understanding from several decades before that this young girl would come to see him, that she would be an extraordinarily advanced devotee, that she would take him as her guru, and that she would in fact realize the self through his power and in his presence. He had no idea when she was going to come, and from the first intimation he got that she was on her way, I think it took another 25 years before she physically showed up. I was talking to him once about her and I said, what impressed you about her? Of all the thousands of people that have come to see you, what made you take this girl to be the one person who could finally realize the self? And he said, I searched her mind again and again and again. I looked really long and hard at it and I couldn't find a single bad thought anywhere. Uh, and I thought, well, that's going to disqualify just about everybody I know on the spiritual path. Who, who, who in this world can present themselves to a jnani 
have their mind be a completely open book, have him search every single page of it and not come up with any impurity, anything which would act as an impediment to realizing the self. So first of all, he did his initial search. He looked at this girl's mind and recognized an immaculate purity. Now he said that after seeing her for some time, he recognized her as being a woman who had served him in his previous life when he was a yogi. Uh, she had been a relatively poor lady who used to make doses, bring them to him and serve him. And she had made that connection from a previous life. She had fallen in love with him from his previous life, so she had that connection. Then she came to him in a state of, there was obviously a very strong bond, a strong connection between them. And Lakshmana Swami surprised me one day when we were talking about her by saying, the self commanded me to grant her liberation. Now that this seemed like an extraordinary statement at the time. So I, I said, how did you hear a message? I mean, wh how, how did the, the order come? And he said, no, no, it wasn't somebody conveying this one person to another. There was, there was a knowledge inside of myself that it was my duty, my, responsi my, my responsibility to grant this girl liberation. He said, I knew that was my duty, my responsibility. So here we have an awful lot of things lining up in her favor. She had a past life connection with him. She obviously loved him from a previous life. She came to him when she was very young immediately fell in love with him. He looked at her mind and saw that it was so pure that he knew that she had a strong chance of realizing the self in her current birth. This is something he's said a few times. He said, if I ever see anyone who is in the same state that Sauda was when she came to see me, I'll take them into my room, I'll lock my door and I won't let them out till they've got it. But until I meet such a person, I'm not going to see people publicly. So he has extraordinarily high standards. And the only person who has met the high bar of purity that he sets for devotees he really wants to work with. He's had one person in 60 or so years of teaching, and this was Saudama. And he, he demonstrated his uh, ability to choose the right jiva, if you like, by inviting her to stay with him in his ashram and in a very short, relatively short period of time, she realized the self. So everything is going in her favor, but she also had to put in an incredible amount of work on her practice. She took him as her guru, surrendered to him, and began to chant his name, uh, Hare Lakshmana, Hare Lakshmana, and also to focus on pictures of him. So her inclination was to worship and surrender the form of her guru. Lakshmana Swami hadn't really come across someone like this before and his own experience of doing inquiry had somehow convinced him that self-inquiry was the way that everybody had to do their sadhana if they wanted to succeed. So he kept trying to tell her to also do self-inquiry which she had zero interest in doing. She said, occasionally I would pretend I'd sit in the corner and pretend I was doing inquiry, but he knew I wasn't doing it. I knew I wasn't doing it. We both knew I wasn't doing it. I was just carrying on with my name and form devotion. The intensity of this sadhana increased. It ratcheted up. And within a couple of years, she was up to, she, to she told me once, 20 hours a day of name and form meditation, either looking at his picture or repeating his name, which left her only four hours of sleep. And she said, when I was asleep, I was dreaming about Swami during the four hours I was asleep. And the force of my love and devotion towards him in my dreams was so strong that it used to wake him up in the middle of the night. Uh, Lakshmana Swami told me, laughing, he said, I didn't get a good night's sleep for the last year she was doing his sadhana. Every time I tried to doze off, this, this woman would zap me with some incredible bolt of devotion. I'd wake up from my sleep and then I'd try and go back again and she'd wake me up again. And he said, I talked to her and I said, well, can't you stop it? Let's, let's have a few hours sleep at night between us. And she said, Swami, I can't. 
I have no capacity to slow it down. I have no capacity to stop. It's there all the time. And like Swami, he said, this, this is how it has to be if you are serious. You can't do it intermittently. He said, it's like the continuous flow of oil from the devotee towards the name and form of the beloved. If you stop, it's not going to work. So she reached the stage where this continuous flow of love, devotion, surrender was pouring into him 24 hours a day to the extent that he wasn't getting any sleep. She was keeping him awake at night. Finally, she reached a stage which Lakshmana Swami has called the effortless thought-free state. This is the point at which uh, self-inquiry and devotion merge in his teachings. He said, if you do self-inquiry well, you reach a state where the mind no longer has any interest in the ideas, the perceptions that appear in front of it. It's, it no longer has any extroverting energy. It just remains quiet and thought-free. And Saradama reached this stage simply by burning up her mind through non-stop love and devotion to the name and form of her guru. So she reached this effortless thought-free state, at which point she started to go into regular and deep samadhi. She, she said, I reached the stage where I couldn't say Swami's name anymore. There was nothing inside me that could even extrovert to say his name or feel anything, any projection of energy towards an image. At which point the mind, shorn of all, all of its extroverting capacity, including its previous desires to uh, move out to an image of the beloved, would sink back into the self and she would start to experience samadhi. A point came in 1978 when Lakshmana Swami said, I just knew this was, this was her final moment. So she was in the room with him. And she said the I, the residual I inside her started to get very agitated. And she said she could feel it jumping up and down from the heart center that Bhagavan speaks about up to the head and f physically uh, banging on the inside of her skull. She said it was like something was inside my head trying to get out. It was banging away on the inside and she got the feeling that if it succeeded, it would actually break open her skull. It, she said it was the most excruciating pain. She went up to Lakshmana Swami uh, a couple of times, took his hand, put it on her head to alleviate the pain. The I thought the mind went back a little bit, but then it would start getting agitated and jump up again. And finally, she went up to him and put her head on his feet and the, the power in the Guru's feet uh, was enough. The eye went back into the heart and it died there and she attained self-realization in his presence. Now look, look at all the things that had to be lined up for this girl to do this. She needed a strong past life connection with her Guru. She needed to be born in the same town as him. She needed to go there as a young girl. She needed to fall madly in love with him. She needed to be with a Guru who had this immense power to purify the mind and ultimately extinguish it. All of these things lined up and in the end she succeeded. So what I'm trying to say is that don't expect to get liberation, get enlightened if you have your meditation, your spiritual practice as a hobby. Uh, it's intense, non-stop. It, it has to consume all of your interests, all of your desires. Nothing else has to get a look in. And finally, 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 if you're really lucky, you'll be brought into the presence of someone who can look at your residual eye, who can make it go back to its source and destroy it there. I talked to Papaji about the japa that he did when he was a sadak, and we had a general discussion on it out of which came some quite startling uh, side stories. The good thing about Papaji was what, wherever you started, it always reminded him of something else. And he always ended up telling very entertaining stories that possibly were thematically linked to where you started, but as often as not were a completely new topic. 
So we gravitated from the general topic of Japa to a period in his life in 1947 when he was living and working in Chennai and this was I think in the few months prior to Indian independence. The issue of the partition of India had divided the Congress party. Uh, Gandhi was utterly opposed to it and he had been sidelined by the mainstream Congress politicians so he was no longer actively engaged in politics, but he was still conducting prayer meetings in Chennai, uh, I think in, in the Thousand Lights district. Papaji heard about this and he went to see Gandhi. He was, he was an admirer of Gandhi's spiritual state, not necessarily his politics. Papaji was more of a militant, he thought the British should be thrown out, thrown out by force. Gandhi, Gandhi wanted to do it by non-violence, but he, he respected and admired Gandhi's spiritual state. So he attended these prayer meetings in Chennai in 1947. And because Gandhi was so isolated at this point, uh, he wasn't even uh, protected from the people who wanted to see him. So Papaji somehow ended up being his uh, bodyguard and minder. Papaji in the 1940s had a very strong imposing figure. He told me that when he traveled around India he used to keep himself in shape by going to all the wrestling places in all the towns he worked, taking on all comers and usually beating them. So Gandhi got a wrestler Papaji to act as his bodyguard and that there's one fun story that Papaji told me that once uh, one devotee who attended the prayer meeting ran off with one of Papaji's, uh, ran off with one of Gandhi's sandals. Papaji chased him down the street but wasn't able to catch him. Came back and Gandhi said, oh, never, never mind, one is enough for me, which I, I thought was a very Gandhian comment. And I, I suspect Gandhi spent the next day limping around with one chapel on and one missing. But Papaji said he also had the opportunity to sit privately with Gandhi. And he said, one day I was sitting there and I could hear the sound of Ram in a very subtle way. And he looked around, he said, there was nobody else there with us. I looked at Gandhi's lips. My first thought was, he's a Ram Bhakta, that's his mantra. He must be saying it in a, uh, a kind of ventriloquist way, maybe muttering it under his breath. And he said, no, his, his lips were not moving and the sound wasn't coming out of his mouth. He said, and then, uh, then I focused my spiritual radar, if you like, and I realized that the sound was actually emanating from Gandhi's body. That Ga Gandhi's body was so, uh, so pure, so imbued with the japa which he had done for his whole life, that his body was gently and almost inaudibly radiating the sound of Ram. This immediately made me think of uh, Gandhi's final moments uh, when he got shot completely out of the blue he said, Ram Ram, and fell over and died. There, there was something about the Ram Ram mantra that took over his whole being com so completely that the last thing he ever said with a bullet inside him was Ram Ram as he fell over. Papaji commented on this and said, I liked Gandhi and I liked his spiritual maturity. He said, that was the most sattvic body I have ever seen except for my own guru, Ramana Maharshi. You, you couldn't ever get Papaji to agree that anyone was better than Bhagavan, but he put Gandhi second on the list of the most sattvic bodies. He said it shone. There was a golden hue to it, and on a subtle level, it was kind of ra radiating a spiritual purity, at the center of which was this gentle emanation of the sound Ram that was coming off his body the whole time. And then this reminded me of an old devotee of Papaji's in uh, Chikmagalore. In the 1950s, he worked in a South Indian mining town called Chikmagalore. And when I started to write my biography of Papaji, Papaji encouraged all of his old devotees to tell me any stories they had. He gave me access to his old address book. I wrote to everybody who was in there. I said, Papaji's asked me to write to you. Do you have any interesting stories? And one man from Chikmagalore wrote back and said, oh, 
I had a very interesting time with Papagee in the 1950s. I, I was looking for a new house near Chickmagalaw. I asked Papagee to come along and help me choose a good place for me and my family to live. Papagee, without giving any reason or explanation, kept rejecting every single house we came to, uh, giving the most specious reason for rejecting or no reason at all. And he said it was getting very, very frustrating until finally we came to one house and without even going through the front door, Papagee's face lit up and he said, this is the one for you, buy it. And the man who'd written me the letter said, why, we haven't even been inside. And Papagee said, the man who used to live in this house was a very good ram bacter. He's been doing uh, Japa of Ram's name in this house for so long that the whole house is imbued with the name and the sound of Ram. I can hear the name of Ram coming off the bricks of this house. This, this man has charged up this house for you. This is the place for you. This is the perfect sattvic environment for you to do your sadhana. So Papaji could not only sense the sound of Ram coming off Mahatma Gandhi, he also seemed to be aware that if you are a really passionate devotee, and you did your japa in a building, then you charged up that building in the same way that, say, a battery can be charged up with electricity and that power can be used later. One final story in this vein, which I like. Uh, when I was staying with Lakshmanaswamy, this is early 1980s, uh, I had read a book by uh, a devotee of Swami Muktananda in which Muktananda was also extolling the greatness of uh, reciting the name of God and he told an anecdote of two people who were in hospital and one man uh, needed a blood transfusion and he was a very worldly man and the person in the next bed happened to be the right blood group so they took uh, half a litre or a litre of blood from the, the Swami who was next to him put it in the man while he was unconscious and as the, worldly, as the worldly person opened his eyes he apparently started going ram 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 the blood, <laughs> the, the blood inside him temporarily turned him into a ram devotee it didn't last very long just, just for a few seconds before he regained full consciousness he started saying ram 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 so I thought this was a fun story I, to I told Lakshmanaswamy I, I showed him the bit in the book where I'd read it and he wasn't at all convinced. He, he just laughed and he said, well, if that's true, then all the mosquitoes in this ashram must be enlightened.